Few artists in history have had such a wide-ranging impact on art and culture as the French painter Henri Matisse. His distinctly colourful style and often quite experimental works caught the attention of many collectors and critics, and made him, alongside Picasso, one of the most well-known and influential artists of the early 20th century. Matisse's work is quite interesting in many regards, but one that I wish to draw attention to today is his constant pushing against painting's tendency to represent its subjects realistically. Inspired by the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist painters who had sought new ways to paint reality before him, Matisse would devise his own painting methods that went even further in a search for what he termed an art of balance, purity and serenity. This search would lead Matisse to create bright and colourful works that over the course of his career would push the boundaries of representation further than ever before in a search for a deeper sense of beauty that he believed art could uncover in the world around us. Today, we're going to discuss the artworks, processes and ideas of Matisse to try and understand what his art was all about. We'll discuss his development as an artist, the ideas and methods behind his work, and the impact they had not just for modern art, but for our contemporary visual culture as well. Matisse, born in 1869, was the son of a grain merchant, and he enjoyed a relatively middle-class upbringing in his hometown of La Catou Cambrisi, in the north of France. He initially studied law, but found a new calling when his mother bought him some art supplies to pass the time while he recovered from a bout of appendicitis at the age of 20. Having no previous experience with art, he was surprised to find great enjoyment in painting, and the following year he made the brave and perhaps foolhardy decision to refocus his education away from law and towards his newfound interest. It wasn't quite that easy to just jump up and declare yourself an artist, however. Having no prior experience or training to speak of put him at a bit of a disadvantage, though he was not deterred. His first step would be finding a teacher in the seemingly eternal capital of the art world, Paris. Paris at this time was a bit of a melting pot of artistic styles and movements. The inroads made by the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist painters had finally relaxed the grip of the academies. In response, a myriad of new styles were emerging side by side in the city. This multiplicity would benefit Matisse greatly as he arrived in the Parisian art scene as something of a provincial, uneducated in the various ins and outs of the art world. His painting up to this point had been focused on mimicking reproductions of 17th century Dutch oil paintings, quite far from the works he would become known for. This initial interest in realism brought him to the studio of William Adolphe Bougereau, who was pretty much the final form of academic painting made flesh. Bougereau's teaching style stressed the traditional academic approach of drawing from casts and rigorous adherence to his technical standards. As you can imagine, he and Matisse did not get on too well, and after a brief period of torturous study under the arch-academician, Matisse left in search of a tutor who was a bit more his speed. After leaving the studio of Bougereau, Matisse would go on to take evening classes under another established artist, the symbolist painter Gustave Moreau, whose unique teaching style focused on nurturing the voice of the individual student, rather than beating them into submission with plaster cast studies. Moreau's teaching would be foundational for Matisse, as it gave him the confidence to develop his interest in colour as well as his inclination to experiment with more modern approaches. Another figure who helped the young Matisse during this period was the ever-helpful Impressionist Camille Pizarro. Pizarro turned Matisse's attention to Neo-Impressionism, a style which relied on the science of colour theory. Neo-Impressionist artists like George Seurat and Paul Signac used this rigorous style to create unique optical effects in the viewer's eye through tiny dots of unmixed colour. Matisse would learn much from this method, even painting alongside Signac in this style for a time. Matisse benefited greatly from all of these teachers and peers, but there is one more figure we should mention who was pivotal to Matisse's development as he is to all modern art, the proto-modernist post-impressionist Paul Cezanne. As a young man, Matisse had purchased Cezanne's Three Bathers from the dealer Ambrose Vallard, a purchase he could ill afford, but one that turned out to be wise. He held on to it for about 37 years, claiming that it sustained him during the most turbulent moments of his career. From Cezanne, Matisse would learn many things, such as the way colour can lend paintings a kind of structure. Cezanne had constructed his works out of blocks of colours and tones placed adjacent to one another. He analysed his subjects and sought new ways of painting them that went beyond the conventional academic approach. This would inspire Matisse to devise his own ways of seeing his subjects, just as Cezanne had. Matisse did not, however, become a mere imitator of Cezanne. He would instead begin to develop a series of ideas that would advance what Cezanne had begun. This process would take him some time, however, and in those interceding years he would suffer much hardship and doubt. In 1904, he held his first solo show at the gallery of Ambrose Vallard. After years of material hardship and hard work to get there, the response to this show was underwhelming. 
It made little impression and didn't really bring Matisse the recognition he had hoped for. That recognition, however, was not far off as just one year later he would find himself part of an unusual group of artists accepted to the Autumn Salon show. The works they exhibited there were bright and colourful and a synthesis of many of the ideas Matisse had picked up in Paris, though it wasn't exactly to everyone's taste, with one critic famously terming these works a pot of paint flung in the face of the public. The works which caused this dramatic reaction were a part of what we now term the Fauvist movement. Well, I say movement, but that's a bit of a stretch. Fauvism was pretty informal, as far as movements go. There was no café discussions a la Impressionism, nor any of the grand manifesto writing that we'll see later with things like Dada and Futurism. The Fauvist movement, in addition to barely being a movement, was also quite short-lived, existing really only for a couple of shows in 1905 and 1906, when many artists painting in a similar style were admitted to the Salon exhibitions. Most of those who participated were only really passing through on their way elsewhere, among them André de Rain, who alongside Matisse was considered the leader of the style, and Maurice de Vlaminck, pro-cyclist turned painter who famously said he painted with his heart and his loins, though I'd say he'd have been better off using a brush. Also among the Fauvist ranks was a young George Brack, pre-Cubist and once again working in the shadow of a larger historic figure. Of all of them, Matisse was perhaps the most committed to the style, as many of the qualities of Fauvism fit quite well with his own rapidly developing ideas about art. Those qualities of Fauvism emerged from the inspiration Matisse and his contemporaries found in the works of many modern painters who had come before them, including Cézanne, Van Gogh and the Neo-Impressionists. It was the fusion of these painters' ideas regarding colour, visible brushwork, and the nature of observation that would inspire them to create these often messy, brightly coloured works which seemed to explode off the canvas. Their unruly appearance led the critic Louis Voxel to coin the term fauve, French for wild beast, in reference to their creators. This might seem a little melodramatic to us today, especially in reference to Matisse, who seems to have dressed like he was permanently on his way to a job interview. But to people of the time, who were not used to such strong and unnatural colours, these works must have seemed beastly indeed. A signature of the Fauvist style was the separation of colour from subject. Rather than colour being dictated by the subject's surface appearance, it was instead chosen according to what the artist felt would best suit their composition. This allowed Fauvist painters to pick and choose without restraint, and freed the element of colour from the need to represent reality, allowing for it to be used in the most eye-catching manners possible. Another characteristic of the style and a knock-on effect of this loosening of colour was a flattening of the surface. Without carefully modulated tones of light and dark, Fauve's paintings continued the trend of rejecting the illusion of three-dimensional space and embracing the actuality of the canvas's flat surface. This would in turn allow the painter to place more emphasis on their composition, further unifying the elements of painting under this new approach. One more trait of Fauvism, and one which is a little less wild than the rest of it, is its subject matter which remains rooted in traditional subjects. They may have been beasts, but they weren't mad. Fauve's paintings still depict common subjects such as people, landscapes, animals, and nature. They may no longer be quite as real looking, but it's important to note they're still rooted in observing nature, even if it is in a more loose and expressive fashion. The result of this shifting of concerns was the creation of room for the artist to express themselves. Expression of the artist's feelings regarding their subject, expression through the interaction of colour, shape, space and line. This was the reason Matisse and his mates had abandoned realism and apparent good taste. They sacrificed the surface appearance of reality in order to find a way to express a deeper and surpassing sense of beauty, which was to be found in colour, brushwork and composition. As far as examples of the movement go, Matisse's portrait, Woman with a Hat, is fairly emblematic, so let's take a look at that to see some of those beastly traits in action. The painting's subject, Matisse's then wife Amelie, was not so much the cause for concern. As with most Fauvist works, it's a fairly standard subject for a painting, in this case a portrait of a well-to-do woman in her finery, not a million miles away from Renoir's portraits of the new wealthy urban classes from a few decades before. The controversial part is of course not the subject, but the way she was painted. The work's surface is composed of a patchwork of bright colours brushed onto the canvas with apparent speed and excitement. Worse than that, in between the cacophony of colours, there are bare patches of empty canvas which Matisse seemingly hasn't painted at all. As a painter, you have one job, covering things in paint. And yet here's this Matisse fella, just flat out refusing to do so. Despite the outrage such sketchy painting would provoke, Matisse did have good reasons for doing this, which are of course in line with the Fauvist style. 
He has used a free assortment of colours across the surface that, while obviously unnatural, are balanced against one another. The greens play against the reds, and the light purple on the right hand side plays against the small patch of yellow on the other side of Amelie's face. This play of complementary colours lends structure to the work. There is also the selection of tones he has used. The darker blacks and blues of Amelie's hat and dress pop against the light background and make sense of those light patches of unpainted canvas. The strong contrast they create adds dynamism to the work, which further builds that explosive quality of the Fauvist style in tandem with the excitable brushwork. Amelie herself might be painted roughly, but not unrecognisably so. Her hat, dress and fan are all social indicators of her status as a bourgeois woman, which creates tension between that knowledge and the wild painting style. The patchwork of colours Matisse has used to sculpt the planes of her face may not be realistic, but they are indicative of the form, and even a sense of light. Blue and green shadows and orange highlights give us some sense of directional light in the otherwise colourful void of this composition, which further gives us the sense that this is observed, rather than a totally fictional composition. Finally, the blocking and placement of the figure, along with the curves created by her arm and the fan, lend further structure to this otherwise chaotic canvas. It may seem sketchy and rough at first glance, but at a closer inspection, it reveals the careful hand of Matisse at work. He may want to appear as a wild beast, but behind it all is a careful analytic disposition that is enjoying the process of painting and perhaps the pageantry of the Fauvist style. This portrait garnered a lot of controversy, even in comparison to other Fauvist works, which ended up working out well for Matisse, who despite his misgivings, received an unexpected boon when the work was bought by the American novelist and art collector Gertrude Steen. Gertrude and her brother Leo were avid collectors of modern art, and their patronage would be decisive in the careers of many prominent artists at the time. Despite Leo referring to a woman with a hat as the ugliest smear of paint he had ever seen, their art collector instincts ended up paying off, and the purchase marked the beginning of a long relationship with Matisse that propelled the artist to the next stage of his career. Before we go on, let's take a moment to comment on a new trend that the Steens were getting in on, the advent of the art collector. We have already seen the kind of major impact art dealers like Ambrose Vallard and Paul Durand Ruel had on the development of art, and this trend was to further mutate as the 20th century went on. The Steins were among a new wave of private art collectors who were characterised by two factors, being culturally literate and rich as Croesus. As a result, the Steins would have a huge impact on the development of modern art by funding many of the figures we know today, among them Matisse and Picasso. This trend of the rich, a class not traditionally known for their good taste or restraint, getting involved in the arts is interesting. Over time, it would come to replace the old systems of state and church patronage that had funded the arts before, and eventually give birth to the nightmarish hellscape that we now call the art market. It was also thanks to the Steens that Matisse would be introduced to many other contemporary artists and collectors, including Pablo Picasso. These two men were to become the dominant figures of art in the first half of the 20th century. Despite Matisse's apparent uh, initial dislike for the blowhard Spaniard, the talent that each saw in the other would fuel something that approximated a lifelong friendship and artistic rivalry. In those next few years, Matisse would rise to prominence. Now financially secure and growing more confident, he would produce many of his most well-known works, which were increasingly bold in their experimentation with colour, space and line. With this increased fame came increased scrutiny, of course. Matisse felt the need to confront his critics and explain some of ideas in a statement he published in 1908 entitled Notes of a Painter, which we're going to take a look at before we get into some of the more mature Matisse works as it's a pretty useful text to help us understand how he consolidated all those influences from his early days, and how they were incorporated into his ever-developing ideas of a new modern art. Matisse begins his statement by saying that he is interested in what he describes as expression. He says that expression does not lie, as we might think initially, solely in the human face or in some dramatic motion, but rather is present in every aspect of an image from its figures to the space around them to their proportions, all of this contains an expressive quality as well. Figuring out how and what to express leads to the creation of a composition, which Matisse defines as the decorative arrangement of the elements at the painter's command to express his feelings on his subject. As such, every part of the picture has its role to play, and from this it follows that any superfluous elements in a work should be removed, as they add nothing helpful and may even distract the viewer from more vital parts of the composition. 
Matisse also describes his working methods and how they have developed. He says that when he starts working on a picture, the first thing he does is record his superficial sensations of the subject. A first impression, if you will. He notes that when he started, this would sometimes have been enough to satisfy him, but as he has come to see more, as he puts it, this first impression is no longer sufficient to convey what he sees and feels about his subjects. He says that at first he could not stand to look back at old works which seemed to him to be created in embarrassing states of overexcitement, and notes that this was a mistake. What he has come to do instead is to look more closely at his works and his subjects in search of what he terms a condensation of sensations. Which is an interesting way to put it. What he means by this is that rather than being satisfied with that first superficial impression, he instead pushes past it reworking his painting again and again until those first excited sensations are condensed into what he describes as a more serene and broader composition. To illustrate what he means by this, he gives the example of drawing a female figure. His first instincts will be to imbue the drawing with grace and charm, as he puts it. This first impression, however, is not enough. He then seeks to condense his sensations of the figure by seeking out the essential lines that define it. He notes that this reworking process may diminish the charm of that first approach, but this is only because the charm is no longer the only concern. It still exists, but it is now situated within a broader sense of the subject, one that he has condensed from that first sensation. Matisse's example of a female figure also demonstrates that his favourite subject is people, as the human form allows him to express what he describes as his almost religious awe towards life. The human form for Matisse contains endless steps to explore for expressive qualities. Matisse says that he can uncover deeper and essential qualities that go beyond the likeness of a face or the structure of anatomy to find a deeper sense of beauty. Now, Matisse's refusal to settle on the first impression contrasts significantly with the entire movement based around doing pretty much just that, impressionism. Rather than focusing on the moment-to-moment -moment existence of things like impressionism does, Matisse claims that the artist should look for an underlying reality, a truth that exists behind all of those fleeting impressions, which the artist can seize upon. He gives us the example of motion to illustrate the difference between his work and the impressionist approach. When we see a frozen snapshot of a figure in motion, that particular contortion of muscles and tension is meaningless to us, without the understanding of where the motion came from and where it is going. With that knowledge, however, the moment shown condenses, and thus contains an expression of the entire motion. So it is with his work, which seeks to condense the aspects of his subject into an image, which expresses an underlying truth, in contrast to Impressionism's obsession with the single disconnected moment. Having described his concepts, Matisse then gets into some of the mechanics of painting and creating compositions. He says, for example, that if he puts a black dot on a white sheet, that dot is clearly visible from anywhere. If he then puts a second and a third dot, the first mark loses clarity and becomes a bit lost. In order for that first dot to maintain its clarity, it must be altered in some way, made larger or more noticeable, or else it risks becoming lost. He then expands this concept into the realm of colour, where he says that as he sets down strokes of different hues, each new one will diminish the importance of the previous one. A red by itself is quite strong, but place a green and a yellow next to it and that initial red quickly loses its power. To avoid this weakening, it becomes necessary for Matisse to rework his images, balancing the tones and colours carefully so they do not weaken, but instead reinforce one another. This is where the condensation that he described before happens. It emerges from this process of reworking and balancing. Matisse likens the outcome to a musical composition in the way that it must produce a harmonious balancing of the elements, just as a piece of music must harmoniously balance its own tones. Matisse also states that when it comes to colour, its chief goal should be, as with everything else in the painting, in service of expression rather than mimicking reality. As such, he chooses his colours by the sensations they evoke in him rather than their representative qualities. He doesn't rely on colour theory too much either. Having once been a follower of colour theory dependent styles like Neo-Impressionism, he now finds the various rules and dictums of colour theory too limiting. Instead, he only considers a work complete when all of the parts have found their balance in relation to all of the others, not when it complies to any standards of arbitrary colour theories. Having covered all of this, we arrive at the big one, 
the Matisse quote that all accounts of the man are required by international law to mention. The whole art of balance, purity and serenity thing. I hope that what we've covered so far will make this a little bit clearer, but just to be safe, let's go over it just a bit more. Matisse wants to create an art of balance, purity and serenity, which, as we have seen, means establishing harmonious relationships between his painterly elements and foregoing initial appearances in pursuit of a deeper expression of his subjects. The process of reworking and harmonising is where he finds balance. The purity he speaks of come from his refinement of his observations, pairing back his first impression into a composition that expresses his feelings and ideas in as clear a manner as possible, while also removing any excesses that might confuse us along the way. The serenity part refers to his preference for relaxing subject matter, no edgy Goya-style monstrosities for Matisse. They must be soothing, as Matisse's goal is to provide a kind of art which will be relaxing for, as he puts it, the mental worker, for the businessman as well as the man of letters. For these people, Matisse hopes his artwork will become something akin to a good armchair, a comfy and relaxing spot that lets the mentally fatigued man of learning unwind. Matisse is conceiving his art as a mental one, which has appeal first and foremost to educated men with refined tastes, though the quote betrays a bit more than he probably intended it to. The crafty git has singled out two kinds of people, the businessman and the man of letters, as his audience. A wise move, as these people typically have a lot of time and money to waste on ponderous things like artworks. Considering also that his social circle at the time, thanks to the Steens, was composed of folks like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway, it's not surprising that he would think of his art as being for their benefit. What his art is meant to mean to the man of no letters or little business, he is less forthcoming about. Matisse, now established as a big deal in the art world, would, like Picasso, go through many periods in the rest of his life. But his overall goal of achieving an art of balance, purity and serenity would remain the same. With these ideas in mind, let's take a look at an example of his work from around the same time as this statement was written. We've mentioned his proclivity for expressive figures, and many of the works from this time show this off. The one I want to draw your attention to is a diptych, a set of two paintings which he was commissioned to paint by the Russian businessman and art collector Sergei Suchkin. These two works, known simply as Dance and Music, demonstrate many of the traits of Matisse's painting he outlined in his notes, and furthermore, become some of the most well-known examples of modern art in history. Suchkin was an interesting chap. The son of a self-made millionaire industrialist, he collected art much like the Steens with a focus on the new modern styles which appealed to him. And he owned works by Cezanne, Monet, Gauguin and Van Gogh. It was under commission from Suchkin that Matisse undertook work on these two paintings, which were to become an important milestone in his career. The idea for dance came from a previous and also well-loved Matisse work, The Joy of Life, which depicts various figures in the process of, well, enjoying life. Nestled in amongst the painting's beautiful Gauguin reminiscent colours is a circle of dancers that Matisse would return to as his subject for this new work. He first created a mock-up of sorts working out his composition and methods with the goal of conveying his subject in a manner that he intended to seem effortless to the viewer. This aspect is pretty important, as it explains questions that many will no doubt have, which is, why does it look so... basic? Imagine for a moment, if you will, that this work was as well rendered as a work by, say, Bougereau or David. While it would no doubt look a lot more realistic, it's doubtful that it would feel as fluid as Matisse intended. The key to this feeling for Matisse was making it look like the painting itself was effortless and natural, as if it had spontaneously formed on the canvas, appearing out of nowhere, as feelings of joy or the rhythm of dance often do themselves. To achieve this sense of natural ease, he created this first version, now referred to as Dance 1, in full scale using oil paints, which was unusual for a preparatory work but also allowed him to plan and control every aspect of the final version. The difference between it and the version Suchkin got is illustrative of Matisse's process of looking and reworking, and the kind of results it could produce. The second version of Dance keeps the aspects of simplicity and rhythm, but there's been some changes to the colours and the figures that drastically alter the tone. Unlike the soft amorphous forms of the dancers before, these figures have harsher angles, traces of outlines that denote a strength of form not present in Dance 1. Then there is the colour. The rusted red that the figures are soaked in creates a very different feeling to the soft pink flesh tones of before. These figures seem somehow more primitive and tribal, 
we can almost hear the chanting and drum beats of ritual that the movements imply. The refinement of the concept has uncovered something different in the concept of dance, something ancient and ritualistic, as if we are seeing the genesis of the act itself. Matisse's ultra-simple painting style has exposed this expressive quality in a way that more realistic methods would struggle to depict. Just as with the Fauvist works, dance also makes use of ultra-saturated tones that pretty much tell colour theory to take a hike. Rather than toning down areas or making safer choices, Matisse instead balances the painting's harmony on a knife's edge with three competing tones of overpowering colour that he has somehow wrangled into a harmony that evokes a primal creative instinct without rendering the viewer blind. This is that sense of balance at work again. The space of the work, as well, is deliberately confused. Firstly, the background is comprised of two planes of blue and green, with no other distinguishing features. This serves a few purposes. It evokes the idea of virginity through its untouched quality, thus making the act of dancing seem more like a kind of origin point. The bare basic approach also speaks of the purity Matisse sought in his works, only showing what is needed and omitting all else. It also has a bit of fun confusing the space. The green seems to be a hilltop or field of some kind, but the blue could be either sky above or water below. Matisse has deliberately done this to question the illusion of 3D space, as was the style at the time. The painting is not, however, totally flat. The lack of competing detail draws our attention to the one area where there is a sense of depth and movement, the dance itself. The rhythmic distribution of the figures seems to swirl across the canvas, coming towards us and then receding away. At the point which seems closest to us, Matisse has also carefully placed the one break in the circle of dancers. Conveniently layered over the dancer behind his leg so as to not disrupt the colour, this gap can be read as a sort of invitation from Matisse to the viewer to join in the dance themselves. Corel music shares many of the same traits, but its comparatively dour figures don't quite evoke the same excitement. Not even the one who is literally playing the world's smallest violin. Despite perhaps being overshadowed by its more extroverted sibling, the pair of paintings work together to depict the theme Matisse had in mind of the primitive act of artistic creation. The simple, limited painting and refined compositions Matisse has used to depict this subject are quite successful in this service. I don't know about you, but when I look at these works, there is something definitely ancient and powerful about them. As if Matisse had found some simple, archaic harmony that reaches back through the millennia to express a fundamental moment of creation. Suchkin was, needless to say, pretty chuffed with them. Although he did have to wait some five years while Matisse repeatedly repainted the blue parts until he was happy. Suchkin later complained that while they did look great during the day, at night, under his new electric lights, the colour harmony was exceedingly different. Electric lights were not the only unexpected development of the time. Suchkin would in a few short years after Dance and Music's commission find himself exiled and his collection seized by the revolution that swept Russia, which no doubt put the whole lighting situation into perspective. Matisse, back in France, would soon be confronted by a similarly historic event in the First World War. Matisse was by this time too old to fight, though he appears to have faced great anxiety because of the war. The front lines were not far from his childhood home and his elderly mother was in German-controlled territory where he could not reach her. This anxiety is reflected in many of his works from the period leading up to and during the war, where that trademark Matisse colour seems to drain from them and greys and blacks become more pronounced. The Piano Lesson is one of these works, showing Matisse's son hard at work at his thankless task of piano practice, to which his father condemned him for two hours every morning. The most striking thing about this work is its austere dominating grey. The areas of colour that are present seem to recede in power and become more abstract than ever before, barely even registering as objects at all, but rather as geometric intrusions. The boy sitting behind the piano is the most figurative thing we see, and even he seems trapped behind the austere blocks of black and red. The wedge of black across his eye is similarly disconcerting. In discussing many of these more dour works, Matisse talks about reappropriating black as the colour of light rather than the colour of darkness, and in doing so, tries to deny any depressing or non-serene connotations that may be present, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Bathers by the River, which Matisse worked and reworked over the duration of the war, also bears the marks of a deeply felt stress. Its surface is much more divided, its drawing much more severe, and its geometry more angular than the curvy, indulgent Matisse we have come to expect. 
While it lacks the spatial aspects of cubism, it's worth noting that this work doesn't look too far away from Picasso's signature style, which Matisse supposedly rejected. If not on the surface, it does seem that subconsciously the stress of the war was indeed getting to him. Despite any stresses that may have fueled them, these ever more abstract works were received well and further established Matisse's reputation as a master of modern art. Which is exactly why the period of time following the war he spent in Nice from about 1917 to 1930 confounded so many of his critics and admirers. Matisse had left Paris for a holiday in Nice and ended up enjoying it so much he stayed for about a decade, enjoying the light and scenery of the southern French coast. The war years had been hard and the upper class bourgeois lifestyle Matisse was accustomed to in Paris was more or less coming to an end as a result. He may have left Paris in reaction to this and the move definitely marks another turn in his work. Unfortunately for many of his most ardent admirers, these new works produced in Nice would also look like a bit of a cop-out. The problem with Matisse's work in Nice, if there even is one, is that it looks a whole lot like a retreat from the modernism he had previously championed. Gone are the minimal details and flat planes of colour of his previous work, they're replaced by scenes with pattern, more naturalistic spaces, and, my god, a sense of light. Most of these works were painted from his hotel room and focus on interiors and the Mediterranean coast, as well as a slew of women he painted in a fashion reminiscent of odalisque painting. Matisse did say his favourite subject was the human form, and during this period he certainly indulges himself. These paintings were no doubt influenced by the light of the southern coast, but but they also bear traces of Islamic art that he had seen during his trips to Algeria and Morocco, as well as the historical connotations of Odalesque painting itself, half-imagined dreams of harems and extra-European promiscuity that painters from Delacroix to Picasso loved so much. This perceived retreat from modernism, coupled with the more indulgent aspects of his work in this period, have led to a bit of conflict regarding whether or not any of it is any good. Or was Matisse just resting on his laurels, rather than striving endlessly for new modernist plateaus? Some have argued that his work can be dismissed as tawdry, self-indulgent nonsense. Others have claimed it to be a brilliant synthesis of his earlier advances and the impressionist love of light. Robert Hughes, with an interesting take as usual, characterises it as Matisse seeking an artistic connection to an area that had long played host to other great artists like Cezanne and Courbet with Matisse seeking to do for the southern coast what they had done for its countryside. This period could even be considered to be part of the so-called return to order, a trend of more avant-garde artists returning to a more traditional manner of production in a perhaps psychological response to the horrors of the First World War, something that affected many painters of the time, including Picasso. Whatever may be said about these works and their perceived problems or lack thereof, they are in themselves often quite beautiful, show many of the traits we have come to see across Matisse's career. His love of line and colour is now enriched with detailed pattern, and his expressive figures contain more of a sense of flowing weight than ever before. That sense of serenity that he saw is also present, something that was perhaps missing from those wartime works of the previous years. Matisse would work more or less uninterrupted in Nice for many years, and his reputation would continue to grow. During this time, he painted, made sculptures, and continued to draw, amassing an enormous body of work. At the outbreak of the Second World War, however, Matisse's comfortable life in Nice was brought to an end by Allied bombing raids, which forced him to evacuate to a villa near Vence. World War II was harder on Matisse psychologically than the first one had been. His daughter Marguerite, a communist and a member of the French resistance, was captured by the Gestapo. She was tortured, though managed to escape thanks to a stroke of luck. Matisse was distraught at this, but he soon had other problems. He was diagnosed with cancer and had to undergo a risky operation to survive. While he did recover, complications from surgery would leave him bedridden for the rest of his life. This physical difficulty prompted in him a change of working habits that would bring about the final chapter of his artistic career, and perhaps his best work. Despite, or perhaps because of his new limitations, he would discover new ways of working that would at long last unify his love of colour and line. The process that led him to this synthesis had begun unsuspectingly in the 30s, some years before his illness. Once again, working under the commission of a ludicrously wealthy patron, which must have been very mundane for him at this stage, Matisse was asked to design a large mural, and in a very 20th century sort of twist, it was to be a sequel. A sequel in this case to Suchkin's famous commission, The Dance. Dance to dance harder, if you will. 
The ludicrously wealthy individual this time was one Dr. Albert Barnes, an eccentric collector of all things modern who had amassed a huge collection featuring works by everyone from Cezanne to Van Gogh to Monet to Renoir. It's an amazing collection, which Barnes hung almost on top of each other in his own home with all the restraint of a drunken interior designer. And to top it all off, Barnes wished to commission a huge mural from the great Matisse himself. It was during the planning process for this mural when Matisse made a small measurement error, seemingly unnoticeable in the plans when transferred to the large arched surface prepared for it, the discrepancy translated into a major error that required Matisse to quite literally go back to the drawing board. This miscalculation would lead him to discover a simpler method for composing pictures than drawing and scaling them up. If he were to instead use cut out sheets of paper at the same scale as his intended final piece, he could move them at will to create and refine the shapes of his composition. With this method, the mural was quickly completed. This cutout method would be revelatory for Matisse, and later, when he was confined to his bed, he would revisit it as a way to continue working when he could no longer paint or draw in the manner he was accustomed to. The process was, of course, not really anything new. Collage, as we call it today, is the simple act of cutting and sticking paper to create an image. Beloved by children and hated by adults who have to clean up afterwards, Collage had come into popularity in Paris in the early 20th century. The proliferation of cheap printed materials for posters, advertising and newspapers created an abundance of material for financially challenged artists of the day. Picasso and Braque had both experimented with it, and as had Marcel Duchamp. Now it was Matisse's turn to try his hand at it. Aided by his assistants, who would paint sheets of paper with gouache paint, Matisse would cut shapes with a large scissors from the sheets and lay them on top of each other to create compositions. This process would almost replace drawing for him, as he saw it as a new way of doing exactly the same thing. Rather than drawing the shape and filling it with colour, he was now drawing by cutting straight into colour itself. In this way, he arrived at a working method that synthesised his love of drawing and painting into one unified approach. These works show a joy and inquisitiveness that most people have beat out of them at an early age. The fact that Matisse created them as a bedridden man at the end of his life should tell us something of the joy he took from his work and the endless inquisitiveness that he possessed. These works are among his most beloved and it's not hard to see why. They display many of the same concerns for expression, balance and harmony that he had pursued throughout his career. One colour carefully placed next to another, one shape balanced with a counterpoint. The process of cutting and arranging these shapes allowed Matisse to focus all of his attempt on finding those simple formal balances that he always enjoyed. One well-known example of these cut-out works is The Snail, completed in 1953, just a year before Matisse's death. Surprisingly huge if you've ever seen it in real life. This work is about 3 metres tall, and was completed by Matisse cutting sheets and his assistants lightly pinning them in place under his directions. So exacting were his instructions that when the work was sent to be mounted by the framers, an accurate tracing was made so as to not move any of the parts even a millimetre from where Matisse had intended. A further demonstration of his belief in the utmost importance of composition. Now, I know what you're thinking. A snail? Really? That doesn't look like any snail I've ever seen without the aid of hallucinogenic substances. It looks very... abstract, you might say. Well, while there were plenty of actual abstract painters running around by the time this was made, Matisse was not one of them. And even this gargantuan work was not exactly abstract. Instead, it came from observations of nature, as Matisse's work always had. The inspiration for the snail came from a series of drawings Matisse made of actual snails, which he held in one hand and drew with the other. From these studies, he became aware of the geometry present in the swirl of the snail's shell. This naturally occurring spiral became his inspiration, and the result is what we see in the cutout. Matisse translated the swirling shapes of the shell into a swirl of colours, playing one complementary off another and building a compositional spiral that once again demonstrates his need for balance in his work as well as his love of nature. The cutouts represent the last stage of Matisse's career and in many ways an accumulation of the ideas he had dealt with along the way, allowing him to create formally balanced works that really do evoke a kind of serenity in how simple and effortless they appear. Matisse's goal of an air of balance, purity and serenity seems to be realised in these later works, and in the cutouts in particular. But as we have seen, many of these ideas were present in his works all along, it just took nearly a lifetime of practice to really get there. 
The result was a kind of art that privileged the joy of colour and simple graceful line over polished surfaces and realistic depictions, and in doing so, made more room for the artist to express themselves, and more room for a variety of different approaches to painting the world around us. In doing so, Matisse opened the way for artists who came after him to push further away from any kind of traditional representation and fully embrace the possibilities presented by colour, shape and line alone, to uncover that deeper sense of beauty he had saw all along. Matisse's work is of great importance to not only modern art, but also to our wider visual culture as well. The language of simplified shapes and colours that he pioneered has been widely adopted, from corporate logos to the language of graphic design and illustration, which comprises so much of the media and advertising we are bombarded with daily. Consider, if you will, the design of any advert or logo from the start of the 20th century in comparison to their modern equivalents. The influence of Matisse is palpable, as pretty much across the board we see less detail and more communicable shapes and colours become the norm. While there are many reasons for the change in design sensibilities over the last century or so, it's hard to imagine much of our modern visual landscape without Matisse's initial experiments proving the visual efficacy of simplified colour and shape in communicating complex ideas. Matisse's simple and colourful style lends itself well to the hyperfast world of modern visual culture, where a million images at any one time are competing for our attention. What Matisse himself would have taught about this, God only knows. While the traces of his fingerprints are all over our visual culture, it certainly doesn't seem to be very balanced, pure or serene most of the time. And yet, this is a great example of the kind of impact art can have on the day-to-day -day world around us. Before we go too far into the complexities of modern visual culture, there are many more outcomes from the work of Matisse that were contemporary to his own day and which we should also explore. The one I have in mind being that expressive quality he kept banging on about, which many other artists at the time had also noticed, and which would soon lead to another set of artists and movements that we'll be discussing in further detail next time. So I hope you'll join me then, and thanks for watching.